Okay, and thank you, Ray. I'm really excited to be here today, and you know, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, so my presentation is all about creative AI. I think um, you know a lot of people when they think about AI, they think of it in it's still in the frame of traditional computer science. So hopefully, as we walk through the presentation, you'll take something away from it in the sense of like how it is becoming more and more what I like to call creative. So within the last few years, uh, as you know, artificial intelligence technologies have moved from the realm of science fiction to now hard sciences. But as I was saying, people still think of it in terms of uh, you know, traditional computer science. That is, the machines are only suited for performing what you would call like narrow rational or quantitative tasks, such as, you know, for example, asking Siri for directions to the nearest Chinese restaurant or maybe enabling basic marketing automation tasks such as you know, blasting a general broad message to your target audience. But uh, you know, the real value of AI is its ability to step into a qualitative or creative realm and then perform tasks that we think of as uniquely human. So for example, you know, gossiping, or even more uh, you know, importantly and more uh, set for business, uh, generating the highly targeting, uh, targeted material for your marketing efforts in the first place. So basically, creative AI. So what is exactly needed uh, to make machines to be creative? Uh, funny enough, it's definitely not uh, millions of lines of software code where you beforehand have to anticipate you know, every outcome and program for it. But in fact, uh, uh, you know, it, is, it actually does consist of two simple steps. Number one, um, you know, acquiring the data sets that are you know, rich in human emotions, behavior, and sentiments, and then teaching machines how to uh, subjectively analyze these data sets. So if you think about it, it this is not very different than uh, teaching a human, say, philosophy. So here you would need not only uh, the textbooks specific to various topics within a philosophy, such as aesthetics, ethics, or logic, but also uh, teach students how to analyze and apply them. So in machine learning world, uh, we call this acquisition and uh, uh, teaching process also known as, uh, I also call it like uh, training. So now let's tackle you know, these two steps one at a time. First, uh, where do we find these data sets to train our machines to be more creative? Well, the answer is actually going direct to the source. So if you think about all the ways in which modern uh, humans communicate, so you know, first, although it is still dwindling, we do still talk on phones, so voice call, uh, voice calls or audio. Uh, we use uh, text messaging, emailing, so therefore text. We use platforms such as Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, and so on, uh, so pictures and text. And then finally, uh, we use Facebook Live, YouTube, and videos, and so on. Uh, so that therefore videos. <clears throat> so now if you think about it, uh, how, what do all these forms of data have in common? Well, uh, for one, uh, these are all really natural forms of communication, rich in human behavior, emotions, and sentiment. And then secondly, uh, they are completely unstructured in nature. So by that, what I mean is that they don't neatly fit in into your uh, SQL tables or, uh, for example, rows and columns of an Excel. Okay, so now uh, let's take a look at how machines learn from this data uh, through an example of uh, you know, one of the most common applications of machine learning, namely uh, computer vision. So this is a picture of my son uh, when he was uh, six months old. Uh, he's three now and equally daring. And uh, here are a few pictures of my wife. So my son has seen his mother in a variety of different settings, right? Starting from different, le uh, different levels of light, uh, with or without glasses, with long hair, with short hair, with makeup, no makeup, and so on. With each new image he processes, his brain is actually reinforcing connections between the concept of his mother and an image of his mother. So in fact, by the time a human child is six months old, uh, they have taken over a million snapshots of his or her mother, and therefore can take a brief look at any new image and recognize uh, their mother with a very high degree of confidence. 
And uh, that's exactly how uh, artificial neural networks used in machine learning are constructed. Uh, they are modeled after a similar function in our brain, namely a network of synapses and neurons. Uh, it is these neurons that fire signals based on a particular input, uh, something you might uh, remember from your high school uh, biology class, for example. So in a similar manner, a machine learning system uses inputs like images and activates synapses across a computer-based neural network and is thus able to perform tasks such as identifying various objects in the images. Now in practice, uh, what you do is you create a network and pass data through it. And this is the key. You simply uh, let the machine decide what is right, uh, what is right and what is wrong. Uh, and therefore, you know, the uh, earlier speaker also mentioned about the bias. That's where it does uh, creep in. So basically what you do is you don't actually program anything. You just pass the data. You let the machine decide. So basically there is no if then logic if you're familiar with computer programming. And if the machine chooses uh, a wrong answer, you just simply correct it. Uh, this is obviously uh, what we call supervised learning. Again, very similar to how would you how would you uh, how you would teach a human child. Now, obviously, this type of objective analysis is very powerful and forms the basis of some of the most cutting edge technologies out there, uh, such as uh, self-driving cars. However, much more interesting things start to happen when you combine different forms of data sets. So because that actually starts giving us ability to teach machines both the what and the why. Um, so for example, let's say you're a marketer using a product such as uh, Glimpsed. Uh, this is what leveraging the te AI technology would look like to you. Uh, so based on your business problem, so you know, for example, there was a slide earlier about what message is best to promote our organic farms to millennials. Uh, we'll go out and gather the requisite data for your uh, for the sources you have specified. So, for example, it could be actively solicited customer feedback, or you know, just mining the web. And then we break this data apart into its individual parts. So, for example, uh, and then process them separately. So, for example, uh, visuals are processed through a convolutional neural networks uh, to determine content. And the text is parts for emotional and behavioral patterns using a different kind of neural network, which we call a bidirectional gated recurrent neural networks. And then output of those two are individual neural networks are then analyzed through a multiple input neural network. So thereby creating a dynamic ontology of inside categories or themes. And then finally, we surface the insights and actions this, that best fit these themes from the underlying data. So, and then marketer uh, can take a look at it, uh, the resulting output, choose to accept it, update it, or delete it, you know, the form, therefore forming a virtuous loop and you know, helping train the system even further. So what this gives us is the capability to analyze each and every uh, piece of unstructured data for both objective markers as well as subjective context that almost mimics a uh, human level of analysis. So for example, uh, while objectively this image might be tagged as genes and drawers, uh, our AI system is able to also identify human level tags like organized and uh, for, uh, accessible or you know, neat. So now uh, that you are an expert in AI tech, you might be wondering what does all this fancy science enabling uh, companies to do today? Actually a lot. Um, you know, on a base level, it's allowing uh, companies to understand customers on a deep human level. And it is this understanding that they then use to create better, simpler, and much more personal experiences uh, for everyone. With that, um, let's take a look at a few real life case studies uh, showing the application of this technology. So we will start uh, with Abbott. So Glimpsed is an integrated part of the marketing machine at Abbott, uh, and they use this to create uh, digital ads for Pedialyte. Now Abbott, uh, you know, is looking to, uh, is in the process of uh, transforming Pedialyte uh, from something you just give to kids when they're sick to a brand where, you know, everyone reaches out for when they're dehydrated. And in this instance, uh, they wanted to create messaging on how to effectively communicate you know, symptoms and impact of dehydration to consumers. Um, and this is how they went about it. So they logged onto the portal, start by asking a question, and then they chose their target demographics. So think like age, gender, location, household income, and so on. 
Uh, and then they also you know, went ahead uh, and chose the data sources they want to analyze. So for this particular instance, as you can see, uh, they went for uh, directly solicited customer feedback and were able to solicit thousands of uh, responses you know, consisting of pictures, videos, and text uh, within hours. Then the AI system actually analyzed this data and automatically tagged it for both objective markers as well as subjective context. So you know you can also think of these as like key, you know deriving key insights and themes from each and every piece of data. So uh, actually I jumped over a slide. Yeah, this one here. So what you see here is uh, basically a quantified look at the top themes relating to the impact of dehydration on a person's life, along with the most representative data. Uh, using these summaries. Abbott was uh, able to dive into a particular population segment to see uh, which themes resonated the most with their specific audience. Uh, so what did the system find? So based on the segmentation analysis, the system found that there were significant portion of the population in the metro markets that thought dehydration prevented them uh, from spending quality time with their family. So you can think of it as uh, grandparents who can't play catch or a couple who can't go biking together and so on. So the results, the Pedialyte uh, brand was able to seed uh, their content marketing queue with compelling digital content that were highly resonant with their target segments. So notice how they don't mention sick children and doctors, but still emphasize the family, thereby not only staying true to the spirit of their brand, but also extending it to a broader audience. Okay, let me go to the next slide here. So, you know, let's now take a look at another application of AI. Uh, having a little bit of trouble with the screens here. Okay, perfect. Uh, through, uh, uh, through the example of general modes. So in order uh, to discover any hidden uh, product opportunities, they wanted to understand what kind of snacks were people were making and consuming at home. So again, uh, they followed a very similar methodology, establish the query, and basically choose the unstructured data sources, um, and then go with it. Um, so uh, in this case, again, as you can see, uh, you know, analyze the data for and identify different themes and so on. So again, what did they learn? So they found that a significant, a significant portion of young adults were experimenting uh, with ethnic recipes at home, uh, but changing them to be both healthy and fun. So uh, here is an example of a recipe which is in its original form is basically fried garbanzo beans with paprika on top, but in this case was baked a little bit for seasoning. Uh, now let's take a look at uh, the, the final example. Yeah, so this is the final example uh, through an example of Hallmark who use us to develop uh, basically uh, e-greeting cards uh, for their website. So in order to discover any hidden product opportunities. Uh, they wanted to understand how millennials who were basically not close uh, to their family were spending Thanksgiving. So, you know, basically following the same process, what did they learn? Uh, so they found out that sure there were folks that didn't do anything for Thanksgiving and there were folk, uh, people who went home nonetheless, but uh, there was an interesting segment of the population that decided to celebrate the holiday with their friends instead. So therefore, uh, you know, the concept of friends giving line of cards, um, uh, journals and, you know, play settings and so on. So now you can invite and entertain your friends in style and not through basically a lame email. Uh, so the most uh, compelling part of AI applications like these is obviously the ROI. So if you take an example of, you know, digital content creation, uh, you, you can see all the steps involved, uh, both in the old way of doing things and the new way of doing things. So for example, the new way is ob uh, obviously much more simpler, faster. We're talking hours versus weeks, cheaper, um, you know, costs almost 90% less, and then better uh, in a lot of ways because machine does the hard work of uh, sifting through millions of possibilities so you don't have to do that. Okay, 
So now tying it all back to MR, so and thinking about like um, you know all the ways uh, in which you can activate uh, this new way of doing things. So a few use cases where you can actually use the technology today. And if you're still on the fence, you know you can actually start much more uh, simply. So maybe you already have uh, unstructured data sitting in your knowledge management portal. You can and you want to analyze it for patterns. That's one option. Uh, if you do run surveys, um, you know, think about collecting videos uh, instead of open-ended text. Or if you're already listening on social media, you know, make sure you're not leaving out the visual content from your analysis. Uh, basically, the good news is it's actually relatively simple to get started. Um, so I'll leave you with that. Um, you, know, you know, remember this is just the start. Uh, we're actually very close. Uh, closer than most of us might be aware of. And uh, if you think about the future, um, you know, what does it hold? In my opinion, a lot of promise. I'm actually very optimistic about the future because the foundational concepts, as I was saying earlier, uh, for training the machines are in fact coming from our human brain. So if you believe in humanity, you believe that what we create would be equally good. So that's it. thank you so much. And, uh, you know, happy to answer any questions.